right. Everyone ready? Woo. I don't usually give intro remarks, but welcome. Remember to uh, get more drinks and tip the concessions and the bar and all that stuff. Um, we hopefully are still doing the show here at the end of the month, so hopefully at some point I'll be able to talk to John Bowman and tell Chris the date. But February is really tight, so we don't have the date yet. I'm hoping that we can talk them into doing it the last Thursday of February. But we're usually on a Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, which are all taken. There's some big folk singer coming in. You can't do Thursdays. Well, Thursdays don't work, so I don't know. We'll figure it out. We need, we need a DJ. What's that? We're getting some running around show. Sound like superstar. Anyway, so uh, the host will be up shortly to give you more notes, but I have some notes here that I was handed that uh, we need to change the name from the Jules Works Follies to the Jules Works Ducks. The Ducks? Wait, we're the fucking Ducks? Man, what brainheaded moron came up with that idea? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. But I didn't have a choice. We're being sponsored. Yay. Sponsored by whom? <coughs> by not Donald or Daisy. <laughs> by George R. R. Martin. He likes ducks, apparently. <laughs> so what? You don't want to be ducks? What, you'd rather be District 5 or some stupid number? Better than some stupid animal. Look, I'll have you know, Peter, that the duck is one of the most <laughs> noble, agile, and intelligent creatures of the animal kingdom. The duck is wimpy, like floppy penises from Game of Thrones. <laughs> they don't even have teeth. Neither do hockey players or Targaryens. Have you guys ever seen a flock of ducks flying in perfect formation? It's beautiful. It's pretty awesome the way they all stick together. Ducks never say die. Have you ever seen a duck fight? No. <laughs> you know why? Because the other animals are afraid. They know, they know if they mess with one duck, they gotta mess with the whole flock. Man, I'd be proud to be a duck. I'd be proud to fly with any one of you. So how about it? Who's a duck? I'll be a hey, duck. Yeah, Me too. No. 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 Fuck you, man. We're the Jules Marks ducks. Jules Marks ducks. This is a mallardy. Greg Turner is going to open the show with a fabulous musical number. From the first time I saw you there When I looked in your eyes How could we have ever known You'd be so paralyzed Now the days they go passing by And you don't know my name it's another lost heartache And it's always the same You stare out the window all day With all the thoughts in your head Speak the words that you cannot say Lying there in your bed You were caught in the line of fire In the wrong place at the wrong time Now it's another lost heartache And the pain it's all mine It's fed to your face And there's a strap It's across your chin It's another lost heartache One that we'll never win Now the life has gone out of your eyes and your skin's turning gray They've turned off the power tonight Now you can't get away The other night you had so much life But then that cop he pulled out his gun Now we're 
wherever you've gone to <coughs> is where we all come from. The other night you had so much life, I can't believe that you've gone away. It's another lost heartache. That's the way it will stay. All right. All right. Help me out. Give me a beat. same truck dealership and he used to tell me that falling in love with me was like lettuce <laughs> oh you see when he was a child he had colitis so he wasn't allowed any roughage <laughs> and he missed it a lot <laughs> so the first gift he gave me was this ring and it and it spelled lettuce see here l-e-t-t-u-c-a it's a little tight Anyway, before we made love, he told me that he'd been in some trouble and he'd been arrested and he's probably going to prison. And then he told me all over again because he wanted to make sure he had misled me. But you know, I wasn't shocked because I'm a gorman and my family's always doing things. <laughs> my grandmama and my mama, they was both arrested for making gin in the bathtub. Oh, my Auntie Bernice, she's a policewoman, and she got thrown off the Baltimore Police Abortion Squad for arranging abortions. <laughs> oh, and my cousin Davey faked his death to get out of his pay and his car payments. <laughs> anyway, Ray and I fell in love, and he left his wife, and I left my husband, and he was sentenced to seven years. <laughs> well, it was a minimum security prison, and I used to go visit him every weekend. And sometimes I would wear these, these loose fit and cotton pants. And I had cut a hole Ooh, in the crotch <laughs> for easy access of Ray's finger. Now, of course, this didn't do much for Ray. <laughs> but you know, he always wanted me to know he could take better care of me even in jail than somebody who was outside of jail. And you know what? It felt good to put something over on them guards. I mean, they treated you so horrible. They checked you in, they frisked you, they went through your bag like they owned you, which they did. Anyway, after two and a half years, Ray gets out and I go to pick him up and I'm wearing these caramel color go-go boots and this raincoat. And Ray comes out and he's grinning from ear to ear because he knows. I ain't got nothing on underneath, and the gods didn't know. <laughs> we just celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. I'm a state senator now. <laughs> and Ray, he's a, he's a life coach. <laughs> he coaches people on their lives. <laughs> if you lived in the same town, you'd know who we were, but you wouldn't know the whole story. <laughs> <clears throat> First time with the uh, Jules Works Ducks. Yep, proud to be Ducks. First time on the stage anyway. She's been here lots of times and uh, she's moved to Santa Fe, so we hope to have more from her. Patrick Chavez comes back after a mm -hmm. lengthy absence. Yeah, Too so lengthy. And uh, please give him a warm mm -hmm. welcome for more of his original Zoe stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, hi, good to be back. Yeah. This is Trees, 
Zoe was a canotty girl and was sent to bed early. <laughs> shame, shame, shame. The other trees were playing ball, but Zoe knew she wasn't the one who did, but she was sure to find out. Papa had been painting all afternoon. The fence looked so nice, a bright blue background with just a bit of white fluffy clouds. Then he painted pictures of different members of the family. There was Margaret Maple with her autumnal colored red highlights, Connie Cottonwood and her brother Cotty, Ashley and Andrew Aspen. He had just gone in for a quick pit stop, Papa was talking about. He had to rattle his leaves, so to speak. When he came out, his hard work was ruined. Oh, someone had splashed an open can of paint on his beautiful handiwork. He gathered the kids, checked their roots for evidence. Everyone was clean. Well, uh, you guessed it, except Zoe. She had paint on her roots, some splatter on the rest of her limbs. She tried to explain she didn't do it, but the overwhelming evidence said otherwise. She tried to think how she was standing there and suddenly the paint can flew at her. She tried to duck and it bounced off her trunk. And then the awful can bit into the wall. Hey, thanks for turning off my light. <laughs> <laughs> Great for the video. <laughs> right? Okay. First, she picked up the can uh, as Papua came around the corner, whistling <whistles> happily. I'll oh, just, ah, oh, my work's all done, yay. Right? His face changed dramatically. Yeah, can you turn the lights up just a little hair, please? Can you no? You can't all, right. all right, cool. <laughs> Thanks. All right. You need a flashlight? No, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Let me just print that over here a little closer. Old age and blindness, kind of a, you know, you may have been there. All right. <laughs> okay. Of course, you picked up the can as Papa came around the corner, whistling happily. His face changed dramatically as he. Ah, I don't know, man. La Luz. Hang on just a second. La Luz. Yeah, just stop. Hang on. I got, I got other eyes. Give me a second. I could read there for a moment. I don't know what happened to the light. Let me get my glasses. Thanks. Hope you guys having a good time. Right on. Thanks for coming out this <laughs> week. Okay, so you can all quack at that one, right? Yeah. Okay. And on they go. Oh, wow, amazing. Now I can see now, right? All right. So what happened, right? Zoe's got a panic paint. Her dad had just been painting. He walks around the corner, paint everywhere, right? His fence just beautifully done. Oh, trashed, right? And then he found his ruined painting, and she was holding the can and crying. <clears throat> he was so mad that all he could do was point his longest, boniest branch towards the house. And the loss of William Zoe cry. She ran to the house. She went in, cleaned as best as she could. Soon she was in bed trying to figure out what had happened. Nothing seemed to make any sense. There was no one else around. She began to think maybe she had, but she loved her papa's art so much that she couldn't have done it. The next day, Zoe was confined to her room. Papa and the others pitched in to repaint the fence. Nobody could believe she had done this tragic deed, right? The fence was finally where it was yesterday, about this time. The fence looked even better than the day before. Suddenly, a giant gust of wind came up and blew so hard and fast, it lifted one of the paint cans and threw it right at the wall. Shock spread across their faces as the painting had once again been desecrated. Papa called Zoe, and meekly she came. He briskly approached her and hugged her as everyone <laughs> laughed heartily. They explained what and how the fence was, dis was ruined. Curses! Then a cool breeze blew, cooling them. They continued laughing and welcomed the wind. 
as it blew their leaves to and fro. Good night, my sweet little puff. Love you, Papa. The end. Thank you. Hey, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And now the Jules Works ripoff squad will present a skit from the bygone era of SNL's three S's. Sandler, Schneider, and Spade. Hey man, I used to be a better musician myself. I don't need your hand out, man. I'm not a beggar. I'm look, an bro. artist. Look, bro, sorry. Well, take your money back. You just keep it. Fuck you. God. Hey, what are you doing? Well, you're a street musician, right? Yeah, so? So I'm giving you money? <laughs> I'm an artist, man. I'm not doing this for the money. Uh, okay. Then why do you have change in there? That's where I keep my change, man. My guitar case. No law against it. Okay. Please give me your money. I'm very hungry. Please give me your money so I can eat. I'm really an artist. Uh, here, just take it. You need it more than me. What the hell did I just say? <laughs> well, you said that you're an artist and you're not doing this for money. That's right. Right. But then you started singing and you said you needed the money or you will starve. So, please. If I sing, please, Mr. Postman, doesn't mean you go out and shoot up all fucking post office. <laughs> okay. <coughs> yes, not. That's right. Right. It's just a song. Yeah. So take your money. All right. It wasn't just a song. <laughs> I really need the money. I'm just too embarrassed to let you give it to me. So please come back. The money in my case. I'm not really an artist, just a beggar in disgrace. What are you doing? I saw that. Well, I agree. you don't have to be embarrassed. I heard your song. It's okay. Understand what? I told you not to throw money in there. Uh, it's okay. I heard your song. If you want, just consider it alone. It's just a song, man. I'm doing my next record about poor people, okay? <laughs> I'm just down here for the acoustics. Really? Are you sure? Because it sounded really a lot like you were specifically telling me to give you money. The song's not about you, man. What are you, a fucking eagle maniac? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Hey, you mister with the black velvet blazer. <laughs> Grey scarf wrapped around your neck. <laughs> Sorry I called you Eagle Maniac, I didn't really mean it. So let's do a song, it's what's really important. We're still very hungry, whenever you can spare. Very welcome to my despair. Listen, my train's coming, I'm just gonna stand this next to the guitar case. Uh, and if you want it, fine. If you don't want it, Fine. Leave your money, you arrogant, you'll be creep! <laughs> God! Fuck. Hey, uh, buddy, you mind if I play here? Oh, sure, man. A little bit of, like, harmonic accompaniment. <laughs> Please go away. I'd rather play alone. I was here first, and you're holding on my action. <laughs> hey, man, if you want me to leave, I'll leave. No, nah, man, it's great, man. That last chord you played, it was fucking perfect. It was great. <laughs> One of you wants to leave. Now I'll we'll have to kill you when you're not looking. Throw you in front of the train and I'll never find your body. <laughs> hey man, where are you going? <laughs> Fucking people. Woo! <laughs> 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 Jules isn't always funny. That's right. Jules. As George Carlin. Hey. It was in the chair. I don't know. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It's right there. All right. There's a reason why 
that's, but there's a reason for this. There's a reason why education sucks. And it's the same reason why it will never ever be fixed. Don't look for it. Be happy with the, what you got. Because the owners of this country, they don't want it fixed. I'm talking about the real owners now. The big owners, the wealthy, the big wealthy business interests. They control and make all the important decisions. Forget about the politicians. The politicians are irrelevant. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own and control all the land. They own and control all the big corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Congress, the Senate, the state houses, the city halls, and they got all the judges in their back pocket. And they own all the big media corporations, which means they control all the, just about all the news and information you get to see. They got you by the balls. And they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying and lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everyone else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want educated citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want that. They don't want people capable of critical thinking who, they don't want people smart enough to sit around a kitchen table talking about how they're getting <laughs> fucked in the ass by strange people in the corner and a system that's no global board. <laughs> 30 years ago, they don't want that. They want obedient workers, not horse heads. Obedient workers, people just smart enough to do the jobs and run the paperwork and do the machines and just dumb enough to passively sit back and take these increasingly shitty jobs with longer hours, lower pay, reduced <laughs> benefits, and of overtime. And now they want your social security money. That's right. They want your retirement money so they can give it to their rich criminal friends back on Wall Street. And you know something? They'll get it. They'll get it all from you sooner or later. Because they own this fucking place. They own this big place. It's a big club. And you and I ain't in it. We are not in the big club. By the way, it's the same big club they use to beat you over the head with all day long when they tell you what to believe. All day long, beating over your head with the big media, telling you what to believe, what to think, what to buy. The table is tilted, folks. The game is rigged. And nobody seems to notice. Nobody seems to care. Good, honest people, blue collar, white collar, it doesn't matter what color shit you got on. Good, honest, hardworking people, people of modest means. Continue to elect these rich cocksuckers who don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about you. <laughs> they don't care about you at all, at all, at all. And nobody seems to notice. Nobody cares. That's what the owners count on. That Americans will remain willfully ignorant of the big red, white, and blue dick that's being jammed up to assholes every day. Because the owners of this country know the truth. And they wear suits. They know, then they call it the American dream. <laughs> you gotta be asleep to believe it. Woo! <laughs> okay, I'm ready to hear that dancing with horse is ready to go. Oh my Testies, one, two, three. Testies? Uh, ever since I started working at the reactor, I've taken a real shine to nuclear power. <laughs> Bacteria may seem unpleasant at first, but it grows on you. <laughs> Congress doesn't need a raise. They'll just spend it on drugs, prostitutes, and Bibles. 
Bulimic cannibals never forget a face. It's a good thing Bruce Lee didn't have restless leg syndrome. <laughs> Hanging was the original form of suspended animation. Saudi Arabia has a new beheader of state. <laughs> King Abdullah of the house of sadomasochism. They like to cut people's heads over there and they also have a hands-off approach towards crime. An oral history of prostitution is a hard thing to sink one's teeth into. <laughs> Marie Antoinette is remembered for giving head to crowds. Oh. Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. <laughs> it was too soon then. It's too soon now. The robot told me not to press his buttons. <sighs> Necrophilia is a dish best served cold. I don't get it. Let's see, what do we got here? Double entendres dish, right? Understand now? No? I don't That's right. Nobody cares. I thought for a while about getting a corpse pregnant, but I didn't want to raise it in that environment. Malignant narcissism is all fun and games till someone loses an eye. <laughs> Organ donation is not all it's cut out to be. All you can eat mutated porpoise special at Red Lobster. Julius Caesar had a stabbing pain in his side. Creationists are homo erecti phobes. <laughs> Chiropractors worked back in the day. Bad food is a seasonable offense. Boner needs to get the cotch out of his mouth. They wouldn't get that. I can't. Telekinesis is moving subject matter. Let's see. I've, I've written way too many jokes this month, so I'm just going to decide here. I'm going to take a little, little moment to meditate for it's really like six minutes. Just talk among yourselves. Albuquerque police have found a new mentally ill demographic to shoot themselves. Word on the street is graffiti. <laughs> How many Luddites does it take to smash a light bulb? How many? I have no idea. It's rhetorical. I saw two babies kissing the other day. I told them to get a womb. <laughs> Malaysia Airlines just joined the Mile Deep Club. Defenestration is a sylphated fling. Yeah, there's no English majors in here. I bought a Bible for a friend the other day. I told the sales lady to rapture it. Joan of Arc was fired for being a woman. The high court must be smoking some good shit. It's kind of dumb. <laughs> like most of the rest. The Romans invented the fork, but it took 1,500 years for the rest of Europe to get with the tines. <laughs> <laughs> Trophy wives are sweating to the oldies. <laughs> the Muppet was smoked for wearing a wire. Joan of Arc was the first freedom fry. Let's see. Let's try to get through this quickly and as painlessly as possible. Necrophiliacs have near-death experiences all the time. <laughs> oh, no. 
We are afraid of change because it rattles around in our pockets. <laughs> Invertebrates are spineless creatures. <laughs> They're not cute. <laughs> Disgusting. The seven dwarves just contracted smallpox. Disneyland. I complimented both my wives, which was big of me. <laughs> he who laughs longest is probably mentally ill. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to do a little music. I'm just going to go with the music now. Pull the gibbons from your hair. It's fun to play with recombinant DNA. Having my rape, baby. I'm a Republican in love with visitation rights and you can't sue me. <laughs> Darling, if you want me to be closer to you, treat that leprosy. <laughs> oh, bulimia, I'm down on my knees. I'm begging you, please, then I groan. Oh. I was a high school loser, never made it with a lady till I started working at the morgue. I'm proud to be an American, because at least I have three teeth. <laughs> Your own personal Buddha. Reach out and rub me. <laughs> Love myself better than food. I know it's wrong, but what can I do? <laughs> Stupid. All right. I'm romancing the drone, incinerating your poor children's homes every night and every day. Gonna blow your family away. Cause we're living in a world of fuels, breaking them down. Science joke, nobody gets those. <laughs> See if anything else you need to hear. <laughs> Come on, take another little piece of my heart now, Cheney. <laughs> no one can stop you now. Tonight you're on a moose. I can see clearly now, my brain is gone. <laughs> Who loves you, Oxford, comma? Who's gonna use you when they write? <laughs> hush, hush, keep it down now, cousins Mary. <laughs> I'll finish with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger singing shout. Shout, shout, let it all out. These are the things I can do without. Come on. I'm talking to you. Come on. Ah, ladies and gentlemen. What's Fuller, Vaudeville's modern day hero. He's sure gonna save the Joe's Works Ducks bacon. <laughs> I'm gonna sing you an old Tin Pan Alley song. Um, the uh, Tin Pan Alley was a uh, music distribution company out of New York City in the 1920s. And uh, it was a bunch of um, immigrants, mostly Russian, composing ragtime classics. And um, they usually came out really cheesy. So I'm going to sing one now. I'm going to sing uh, one of the Tin Pan Alley classics, and then later I'm going to sing you uh, one that I composed. This is called My Melancholy Baby. <clears throat> Come, sweetheart mine, 
Don't sit and pine. Tell me of the worries that make you feel so blue. I'm sorry, hon. What have I done? Have I ever said unkind words to you? My heart is true for only you. I would do most anything at any time. Hear when you sigh, or when you cry, but something seems to grip this very heart of mine. Come to me, my melancholy baby. Cuddle up and don't be blue. Oh, all your fears are foolish fancy, maybe. Don't you know, dear, I'm in love with you? Every cloud must have its silver lining. But wait until the sun shines through. And smile, my honey dear, while I kiss away each tear. And then I won't be melancholy too. And smile, my honey dear, while I kiss away each tear. And then I won't be melancholy too. Thank you. Stay tuned. We will present more of our serialized reading of the original radio play, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Previously on Battlestar Galactica, er, on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, our hero, maybe, Arthur Dent, was in the office of the great award-winning world builder, Slarky Parkfast, on the planet called Magrathia. They had just activated, through archival recordings, the wise computer, Deep Thought, which had attracted the various entities who were very eager to get questions answered. The question, in fact. Deep Thought has informed anyone listening that he can indeed answer the question, what is the meaning of life? But it will take him seven and a half million years to process the results. I don't understand what's all this got to do with uh, the earth and mice and things. All will become clear to you, Earthman. Are you not curious? To hear what the computer had to say seven and a half million years later. Oh, well, yes, of course, quite curious. Here is a recording of that fateful day. <laughs> oh, people who wait in the shadow of deep thought, honored descendants of room fondle and magic thighs, the great and most truly interesting pundits of the universe has ever known. The time of waiting is over. Yeah! Seven and a half million years our race has waited for the great and powerful enlightening day, the day of the answer. Never again will we wake up in the morning and think, who am I? What is my purpose in life? Does it cosmically speaking really matter if I get up and go to work today? For today, today we will finally learn once and for all the plain and simple answer to the things nagging us answered the problem in the universe and everything. Woo! From today we can enjoy 
a game of Rocky and Ultra Cricket in the firm and comfortable knowledge that the meaning of life is well and truly sorted out. <laughs> Our ancestors set this program in motion. An awesome prospect! <clears throat> Deep Thought prepares to speak! Ahem. Good evening. Good evening, oh Deep Thought. Uh, um, do you have a... An answer for you? Yes! Yes, I have. There really is one? There really is one. To everything, the great question of life, the universe, and everything? Yes. And are you ready to give it to us? I am. Now? Now. Wow. Though I don't think you're going to like it. It doesn't matter. We must know it. Now? Yes, now. All right. Well? You're really not going to like it. Tell us. Tell us. All right. The answer to everything. Life, yes? the universe, and everything yeah. is, yes. is yes. 42. Oh, we're going to get lynched, you know that? It was a tough assignment. 42? 42. I think the problem such as it was was too broadly based. You never actually stated what the question was. But, but, but it was the ultimate question, the question of life. The universe and everything. Exactly. Now that you know the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is 42, all you need to do now is find out what the ultimate question is. Uh, <laughs> all right. Can you please tell us the question? All right. The ultimate question. Yes. Of life, the universe. And everything. And everything. Well, yes. Tricky. No. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. But I'll tell you who can. Who? Tell us. Yeah. Tell who us. is it? Who is it? <laughs> I speak of none but the computer that is to come after me. What computer? A computer whose merest operational parameters I am not worthy to calculate, and yet I will design it for you. Oh, well. Really? You bet. A computer which can calculate the question to the ultimate answer. A computer of such infinite and subtle complexity that organic life itself will form part of its operational matrix. And it shall be called the Earth. Oh, what a dull name. <laughs> so there you have it. Deep Thought built it. We designed it. You uh, lived on it. And the Vogons came and destroyed it five minutes before the program was completed. Yes, ten million years. Just... 10 million years of planning and work gone just like that. Well, that's bureaucracy for you. <laughs> well, you know, this explains a lot of things. All through my life, I've had this strange, unaccountable feeling that something was going on in the world, but nobody would tell me what it was. No, that's just perfectly normal paranoia. Everyone has that. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps it means that somewhere... Oh, outside... well, perhaps, maybe, who cares? Perhaps I'm old and tired, but I always think that the chances of finding out what really is going on are so absurdly remote. The only thing to do is to say, hang the sense of it and just keep yourself occupied. Look at me. I design coastlines. I got an award for Norway. Where's the sense in that? None that I've been able to make out. I've been doing fjords all my life. For a fleeting moment, they become fashionable and I get a major award. In this replacement earth we're building, they've given me Africa to do, and of course, I'm doing it with old fields again because I happen to like them. And I'm old-fashioned enough to think they give a lovely burrow feel to a continent. And they tell me it's not equatorial enough. What does it matter? Science has achieved some wonderful things, of course, but I'd far rather be happy than right any day. And are you happy? Mm, no, that's where it all falls down, of course. <laughs> oh, pity, because it sounded like quite a good lifestyle otherwise. Attention, please, Lati Barfast. Would Lati Barfast and the visiting Earth creature please report immediately, repeat immediately to the works reception area. Come on, you guys, the mice aren't going to hang around in this dimension all day. Oh, come on, I suppose we'd better go and see what those damn mice want. I seem to be having this tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle. As soon as I reach some kind of definite policy about what is my kind of music, 
my kind of restaurant, and my kind of overdraft, people start blowing up my kind of planet and throwing me out of their kind of spaceships. It's so hard to build up anything coherent. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, this almost sounds rather factuous to you. Oh, yes, I thought so. Well, just forget I ever said it. It is, of course, well known that careless cost talks lives, but the full scale of the problem is not always appreciated. For instance, at the very moment that Arthur Dent said, I seem to be having this tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle. A freak wormhole opened up in the fabric of space-time continuum and carried his words far, far back in time, across almost intimate reaches of space to a distant galaxy, where strange and warlike beings were poised at the brink of fright versus frightful interstellar battle the two opposing leaders were meeting for the last time and a dreadful silence fell across the conference table at the commander of the dreadful vulgars resplendent in his black jeweled battle shorts gazed levelly at the Gugavan leader squatting opposite him in a cloud of green sweet smelling steam and with a million sleek and horribly beweaponed star cruisers poised to unleash electric death that his single word of command challenged the vile creature to take back what he said about his mother the creature stirred in his sickly, burling vapor, and at that very moment, the words... I seem to be having this tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle. ...drifted across the conference table. Unfortunately, in the vulgar tongue, this is the most dreadful insult imaginable, and there was nothing for it but to wage terrible war. Eventually, of course, it was realized that the whole thing had been a ghastly mistake, and so the two opposing battle fleets settled their few remaining differences in order to launch a joint attack on our galaxy. Now possibly identified as the source of the offending remark, for thousands more years, the mighty starship tore across the empty wastes of space and finally died, screaming onto the planet Earth, where, due to a terrible miscalculation of scale, the entire battle fleet was accidentally swallowed by a small dog. Those who study the complex interplay of cause and effect in the history of the universe say that this is the sort of thing that's going to happen all the time, but are powerless to prevent it. It's just life, they say. Meanwhile, Arthur Dent is just about to discover the answer to the most disturbing question posed in last week's installment. Are his companions, Ford, Zapod, and Trillian, lying, bleeding to death in the subterranean corridor? Or have they merely slipped out for a quick meal somewhere? So, stay tuned to Battlestar, uh, the Hitch or the Jules Works Follies rendition of the BBC radio play of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Return right here to the John Cocteau for Jules Works 35th edition on date March 2nd. March 2nd. And we thank you. February right, the February, February show, March 2nd. Right. Also the Ducks, right. I want to tell you all about my favorite person in this city. Well, he's the pharmacist from Walgreens, and he takes care of me. And when he fills my prescription, I feel peace and harmony. He asks, how is Dr. Hoffman? Well, she's just doing fine, sir. Tell her there's a new generic. Okay, I'll be sure to remind her. He's the pharmacist from Walgreens, and he knows what I be. Cause when he turns on that computer screen, he sees what he needs to see. Well, he's the pharmacist from Walgreens. Oh, 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 oh. He's the pharmacist from Walgreens. Oh, yeah, and that's all you need to know. Here's why. Clonopin and Prozac, he knows all about that. Pharmacist from Walgreens. Benadryl, etc. Diuretics, enemas, the pharmacist from Walgreens. Still in his little white coat, he looks so sad and bored. Why is that, Greg? I don't know. I think it's because he's the pharmacist from the Walgreens discount store. Whoa. Well, he's the pharmacist from Walgreens. I think I'll see him today. You know, and he'll fill my prescription for a $10 copay. The 
medicine with a warning on it. Don't take it on an empty stomach. He's a pharmacist from Walgreens, and he's our friend today. Lexapro tonight, man, he knows that's the right plan. The pharmacist from Walgreens. Celebrex and Sudafed, Ambien to go to bed. The pharmacist from Walgreens. Still in his little white coat, he looks so sad and bored. There's a big leap of faith. Imagine it's two in the morning and it's getting dark and there's a fog rolling in, though there's not much fog in Santa Fe. And you're staring out at two in the morning again. Where are you? You're right by, say, Baja Tacos, very overrated. And you're staring down at Richards Boulevard, looking for that one shining beacon of light. That one person that can understand what you're going through. This little white coat, he looks so sad and bored. Cause he's the pharmacist from the Walgreens discount store. The Whoa. Key change up to D. He's the pharmacist from Walgreens, and he's a funny guy. His jokes about his wife's arthritis makes you want to slap your thigh. Cortisone for Mrs. Larrips, hemorrhoids where they've begun to flare up. He's the pharmacist from Walgreens, and he's our friend today. One more thing. Well, he cares about your constipation. Stomach gas and regulation. He's the pharmacist from Walgreens. He takes care of you and me. Thank you very much.